Welcome to the Hunter's Advantage Podcast, where a group of budget-minded hunters scour the woods for whitetail bucks and whatever other big game is in season. Tune in each week to hear the hilarious public and private land hunting stories and mistake-filled lessons learned. We believe that every hunt brings us closer to God and that we exist to share the good news. And now, your hosts, Christian Babcock and Jake Gaylord. Listen, guys, we wouldn't be able to do the podcast if it wasn't for you all. So we just want to say that you guys are greatly appreciated, and thank you for following along each week. And speaking of support, we are partnered with Out on a Limb Manufacturing, and I can tell you from firsthand experience, Matt and Chase are great down-to-earth guys, and they make some of the best saddle hunting products out there. Whether you're looking for a set of climbing sticks or a mobile, lightweight, hang-on tree stand, or maybe you're even a one-sticker, You mean tree Pilates? Yes, tree Pilates. If you've been to the grocery store or the gas station lately, you know that Uncle Joe is doing his absolute worst to take all your money. That's why we need hunting gear that lasts year after year. And trust me, I've been rocking the same out on a limb Shakar climbing sticks for four years and the Ridge Runner 2.0 saddle hunting platform for a few years as well. This gear is built to last. We can confidently say that out on a limb is the best bang for your buck. And it's the best gear if you want to deflate a big old buck. Make sure you use code HNTA15 at outonalimmfg.com for 15% off anything on their website. So if you can show them the same support that you guys show us, please go to outonalimmfg.com and use code HNTA15 for 15% off at checkout. Now let's get back to the podcast. All right, guys, on today's episode, we are talking with Johnny King and Jay Fish. A little bit of backstory about the Johnny King buck, if you don't know already. He shot the alleged world record that scored 217 inches, beating the Milo Hansen buck by like four or five inches. We brought on Jay Fish as well because he is a world-renowned antler collector, and he is actually in possession of the Johnny King buck right now. And there's some controversy around this buck with the scoring system, the buck being shot in the antler, and it being put back together before scoring. So it's going to be an interesting episode, and we're really excited to talk to Johnny and Jay. And with that, let's get into it. All right. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Hunters Advantage podcast. Today, we're joined by a couple of special guests, uh, Johnny King and Jay Fish. Thanks for thanks for jumping on and doing this, guys. I'm glad we finally got this uh, figured out and scheduled. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's, it, it's going to be a fun conversation. I look forward to it. Yeah, of course. So uh, before we get into, uh, you know, meat and potatoes and, and the fun part and talk about this uh, Johnny King buck, how uh, how was you guys' season this year or how... How'd hunting go out the, for this season? I'll let you go first, Johnny. All right. Um, I'm really starting to get back into bull hunting a little bit more. Um, I saw a lot of great bucks, um, but just didn't capitalize on rifle season. I got a decent 10 pointer, so I was pretty happy with that. Heck yeah. What about you, Jay? Um, had a pretty good season. I hunt up here in upper Michigan, right up by Lake Superior. So it all depends on our weather and the wolves, how they, how hungry they are, but, uh, <laughs> saw a lot of decent deer and, and, uh, had a lot of fun hunting with family and friends like I always do. And had a couple of guys from my church. I let them hunt my little farm that I have. And one of those guys was able to shoot a decent buck and they got to share the meat. So that probably made my season right there. Heck yeah. Do, do wolves and whitetails mix? <laughs> Oh, they get along just dandy. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I mean, have you seen, I don't know if you guys have always kind of dealt with wolves and uh, where you're at, but have you seen a, a pretty devastating effect on how those two mix in? Like, what's the whitetail population like where you're at? We're kind of really bad right now. Our whitetail population is terrible. Um, the deer are moving into town closer to get out of the hills because that's where the wolves feast on them. And a lot of our, our deer are just, they're getting pushed out of the hills down along the lake shore of Lake Superior. And they're kind of cornered down here right now. And I always tell people, they say, well, there ain't enough wolves to eat enough deer. Well, it's not just what they eat. It's the stress they put on the rest of the herd. The deer, they can't go out and browse like they normally do where they got to feed, be on their feet so much. Now it's, they stick their face in whatever they can find and they run into the swamp under an old tree and, and they bed. And then, uh, you know, then the breeding isn't going as good as it should because 
they're always on their feet and always being chased around. Um, it's just been, it has been really bad on our deer herd up here. Is it open season on those things where you're at? Because here in Oklahoma, we don't have to deal with that. Like our worst case is like a few black bear in the Southeast part. And then we're, we got to deal with the whole mess of coyotes, but, uh, how do they have like a regular season for them? Nope. They're on the endangered species list. They had a, uh, a season about 10 years ago and some federal judge out in Oregon or Washington decided they know more than what our local biologists mm. and he slapped them on the endangered species list. And then, uh, so they're off limits to us and we have an apex predator running around up here. That's unchecked. And now our bear herd, our bear population is the highest it's ever been and recorded. And they cut our bear licenses by 350 in my area. And we do still have the coyotes and, and we have severe weather up here, you know, this year, you know, thank God we're having a mild winter, got this El Nino thing going on. So that's saving some of our deer, but it's like I tell people bad winters come and go, but the wolves are there 365. <laughs> all the time. They don't stop. Yeah. Yeah. That's for sure. And so you're, you're in a uh, Jay, you're, you're UP of Michigan, you said? Yes. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. We've had, had several people um, on the podcast from that area and Johnny, you're, you're grew up hunting in Wisconsin, right? Yeah. I'm Southwest Wisconsin. I'm about an hour from Iowa border. I tell you what, we do a lot of these informational kind of videos and we like to look into like the record books and the numbers and kind of the distribution of where people kill these bucks. Wisconsin, they, they pull their weight when it comes to the Boone and Crockett books. I can tell you that. Yep. Fortunately, we got a lot of nice deer in Wisconsin. Yeah. You got a lot of hunters too, though. <laughs> yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. But it seems to be getting less and less. Um, I don't know what the actual numbers were this year, but I think it's just kind of going down a little bit. It's not like the traditional when you're growing up, um, you know, the whole family and cousins and everybody. I don't see the hunters like I used to when I first started hunting. Did you guys get any of the COVID boom? Because it seemed like where we hunt on during COVID, it's like everybody decided to come out and try to hunt. Uh, I don't really, I don't think it really, not any different here. How about you, Jay? No. Yeah. I'm headed north. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to come everybody. out. You see a hundred inch deer, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> everybody got bored and went and bought a gun, huh? And started hunting. Oh my God. It was seemed terrible. Like it. it was terrible. Yeah. I mean, seemed like you were singing a United States song. And if you drive by the license plate down in Oklahoma or in, on public land, it was like Arkansas, <laughs> Michigan, I mean, Florida, yeah. Georgia, it was everything, but. Oh yeah. Yeah. We got some fair weather and some decent bucks. So I guess that brings the people, people oh, don't yeah. want to deal with that Northern weather. So like, we'll go down South and we got free time. I couldn't handle what is the <laughs> What is the weather? Like when your gun season or whatever, your rifle season, what's the, what is it like in Kansas? Uh, we're, we're in Oklahoma, but, uh, the or uh, Oklahoma. Yeah. Yeah, man, you, you get some, you can get some wicked stuff and some below freezing temperatures during the rut, but it seems like the last decade, the November has been a hot month. Like it does mm -hmm. not seem like, uh, winter comes till mid December into January. I mean, we've got, we get the first week of November when we go on our annual recreation hunt, it, it might be 65, 70 degrees high. Oh, it wow. Sucks. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's no fun, but we, we deal with it. So Johnny, I was watching some, some videos that you, you know, just, you know, in preparation for this podcast. And I, I thought it was pretty interesting. You guys, you grew up in a family that didn't, didn't use any trail cameras and no tree stands, anything like that. That's how you grew up hunting. Yeah. No tree stands, no nothing. Just find a, a log or a telephone post or that was kind of your stand. Yep. Heck yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty fun way to grow up and hunt, right? Do you guys do a lot of bow hunting or was it mainly rifle stuff? Mainly rifle. Yep. Hmm. Nobody yeah. really bow hunted. They were all, it was all family farms. So basically everybody just waited for gun season every year. That was the big family tradition. And we went out and cause they're all dairy farmers didn't have a lot of time to bow hunt, but made time for deer season. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. So I, I'd like to, I'd like to kind of take it back. Um, heck, it's been almost almost twenty years. Twenty years now. You shot that your your big buck um, in two thousand six. Is that right? Correct. Yep. 
All right. So I'd like to take it back maybe a little bit before 2006 as we get into talking about this buck. But um, in that 2006 season, you know, you're a guy that doesn't run trail cameras and you go hunt, you know, from the ground and just kind of wherever you can. What were you thinking going into that 2006 season? Did you did you think, hey, I've got a I got a big buck to hunt this year. I've got a potential record buck. Or did you have any expectations going into that season? No, not really. It's just, just the excitement of getting together with family and cousins and, and telling stories and just, just the hunt itself. I mean, you always, you know, pray that you see a great buck, but if it didn't happen, it didn't happen, but the season never, it was always great time either way. I know we talked on it earlier about Wisconsin holding, you know, some pretty, pretty healthy deer, but are those type of deer that you shot in like an 06? I mean, are those pretty common? I mean, obviously not like 200 inches, but you know, I guess just the size. No, I would say every, everybody in, in our hunting party that we hunted with between my brother, cousins, uncles, everybody's got a really nice one on the wall, but for us, that might be a 130, 150, you know what I mean? And then, but to see that 200, I've, we've never seen anything that big over 200. <laughs> Wait, you, yeah. what were the size you said that your cousins everyone's got a what you said a 160s no no i mean well we're, like i said we're not really big into scoring if i had to go back and look at some of them that my uncles or my cousins or my brother have on the wall anywhere from like 110 to a 150 that that kind of a range but none of the deer have really been scored definitely downplaying it just so people won't flock to your neighborhood <laughs> <laughs> no no it's the honest to god truth nobody in my family's ever had a deer scored yeah, that's the that's like the eye test jake it's like uh you look at one if it makes you if it makes you say oh oh crap and you know that's big enough to pick up the gun and start start shooting that direction oh that's my mother. yeah yeah <laughs> no it's our scoring system is like wow that's pretty nice or Holy crap, I got to get that one. You know, it, it's just, yeah, it, n- no numbers. Just that's a really great buck. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so therefore that 06 buck, that's the first, that's the first year you've ever had scored? Correct. Wow. <laughs> we first shot the deer. We were looking at it. You know, you, you kind of hear about Boone and Crockett over the years and you're like, okay, what's the inside spread? That might be to the extent of our scoring. Like, Oh my God, Uncle Dale, you know, that's 23 inches inside or something like that, but had no idea, you know, what to measure, you know, like the main beams, you know, I've learned a lot over the years, but, but usually we would just measure the inside spread and go, wow, yours is bigger than mine. (laughs) You know what I mean? But yeah. So, so Jay, what's your background in all this? Uh, like how'd you kind of get introduced into hunting and then, uh, and then I guess, I assume you've had more experience with the Boone and Crockett system, right? Yeah. yeah. Started hunting at a very early age. My dad and I have three older brothers. We were every, every chance we had we were, as a family, we were out hunting and, and we didn't make drives or anything and we didn't have tree stands. It was all hiking the hills, uh, hunted on the backside of the high point of Michigan, Mount Arvon. I still hunt there to this day. And, uh, I like hike, hunting up in the oaks and then sneaking down into the edges of the cedar swamps and just reading sign. I'm not a trail camera guy either. And I'll sit in a tree stand now with my bow, but I do more walking with my bow than I do sitting. I've never been a guy that can sit. And I understand that I see more tails going over the, the, the next ridge in front of me than I shoot. <laughs> but I, that's just the way I love to hunt. Uh, you know, the success rate is the lowest spot in stock. And then try to do it with a bow and then you're in a brush in a thicket and try to sneak an arrow through there. Uh, bow hunting is my number one way to hunt. I, I rifle hunt too, not saying I, you know, put the rifle away, but I love my bow hunting. The weather's still pretty decent. You can get out. There's about half the bow hunters up here than rifle hunters. So the woods is pretty open. I, I can go wherever I want. I can get out, stretch my legs and try to figure out what the deer are doing and try to stay, you know, one one move ahead of them. And there's, there's a lot of people that if, uh, if they don't get a notification on their cell camera, they're not going to go that day. So it sounds like, sounds like you guys aren't, aren't doing any of that. I mean, no trail cameras walking around with a bow on the ground. They're, uh, it doesn't get any more fun than that either. I mean, that's pretty fun. It, it, it is fun. And we built a, we built a, a hunting camp up there. We had that for a little over 30 years and, uh, my dad ended up selling it when he couldn't get up there anymore. I had moved out the area for a while 
and still wish we had that camp. But I, I drive by it about a hundred times a year. I'm usually up in those hills anywhere from three to five times a week. Even now, if there ain't too much snow, I, I just like going up there and looking around. I, I know every tree by name almost. The wife quit coming with me. She goes, how many times are you going to tell me you shot a deer over there? <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, but uh, very fortunate to live where I was. We don't have what some people would call trophy bucks, but we have trophy hunts, I call it, because you can't take that experience you know, with a score sheet, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's something about being out and just being able to learn. And I mean, heck, I, I catch myself doing even now too, what having a cell phone and going hunting and stuff. Half the time I'm walking, my I'm looking at my phone, not even looking down at the ground, trying to examine what the deer are actually doing. So that style of hunting, I mean, you just, you can learn a ton doing that where um, if you're just sitting at home waiting for a cell campaign, it's, you're not going to get, you're not going to get any of that. Well, and we got a, a big problem too, where these kids, they don't know how to even track a deer anymore because they haven't learned the woods. They don't know there's a little swamp over here that they'll go tuck themselves in, or there's a little cool creek over here they might try to get to. They just don't know the woods. They walk from a truck to a bait pile and back to their truck and home. All of a sudden they make a marginal shot. They don't know where to go. You know, it's a sad part of hunting. I mean, I still like the numbers out there and, and I would go help anybody track at any time if they call. And I, I helped a few guys this year because I just, I enjoy it. It's nothing. I don't do anything special. I just, I, like I said, I, I fail more than I succeed, but I always have success in the, the journey. I wanted to, I wanted to talk about this, about Johnny's buck. Um, I'd like to get into the kind of the, the depth with it. So, um, I, I was noticing when we were doing, when we were talking about doing this podcast, Jake was talking with you, Johnny, that it seems like more and more of these big bucks, people we have on the podcast, the more you realize that these giant bucks get killed on deer drives, like the Milo Hansen buck, your buck. I, I think Jake and I are going to start adding that to the arsenal next year. Yeah. Get, get some guys together and do some drives. <laughs> Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You always look family at the tradition. Yeah. Yeah. You look in the woods and you're like, man, there's gotta be a big one in there. Well, I guess put three or four people in the woods and start walking and find out you might watch that right. tail run away, but, uh, you, you find out at least he's, he lives. Oh, you get pretty good over the years and where to put the standards and where to go. And you screw up a couple times, you know, where they're going to come out. So you, you're better prepared for the next time, but yeah. Yeah. So I guess let's start from the beginning. We talked a little bit about the 2006 season. You guys had shot some nice bucks in the past. You don't like to run trail cameras. You, um, sit on the ground, but you do a lot of drives. How did, how did this hunt for your potential record buck go? How did it start? Well, usually like in the morning, we all, you know, get there early, say hi and where everybody's going to kind of go sit. And we sit for a couple hours and then we kind of come back to the buildings, we call it, and we just kind of hang out and Hey, what'd you see? What'd you get? That kind of thing. And then we kind of regroup and we start doing deer drives. And that particular day, the drive that we, that I shot that deer, I'm one of the youngest ones in the group. So I'm always a driver, which doesn't bother me mm -hmm. because over the years, I just kind of learned, you know, where to go and kind of kick the deer out for everybody. And a lot of times, I mean, I've shot a lot of deer just driving, um, before the, the standards even it gets out to them. And in this particular day, the woods we we're driving, it's, it's not a good drive to do. It's, it's really multi-floral, um, really brushy. It usually takes about an hour, hour and a half to kind of get through it. Well, for some reason that day, my brother told me, he goes, well, why don't you take my spot? He goes, I'll drive it. And I'm like, well, sure. You know, I'll go sit down. So that's kind of how it started. He put me on the stand and I walked out there and basically on this, he sits by a telephone pole on this particular stand. And I walked down through this draw, got up to the telephone pole and I sat down, you know, leaned my back up against the pole and kind of got everything situated. And I looked to my right and the deer came actually from the woods behind me into the woods we were driving. So before the drivers even got to the other edge of the woods, they weren't even out of the pickup trucks yet. I saw the, the king buck. You see the buck, you're... This is one of the weird circumstances where you actually get to sit and hunt. What, what happens from there? I saw it for, uh, I mean, just a brief second and I'm like, oh my God, I've never seen anything that big. But then there was like winding hills or whatever. 
so from where I was and I'm like, Oh my God, you know, where's it going to come out? And it, it got up on top of a hill in like this little wood patch. And I could see it, it was probably about 150 yards away. And then all of a sudden two doe popped their heads up. Well, he watched me walk through there because I walked right by where he came out and he was chasing does. So I was already sitting down at that point. So I just put my, my rifle on my knee and I took a shot at him. And then I knew I hit him because he kind of reared back and it was kind of a, for a 30, 30 bolt action, it was probably about 150 yard shot, but I knew I, I hit him. That's a poke. <laughs> That's a poke. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question. I know y'all said that uh, you don't run trail cameras out there, but since it is family land, has there been any like possible sightings of that buck? Is there like a rumor floating around that area where it's like, Oh, Hey, I've seen a giant out there before. Yeah. Now that it, after I shot it, people came forward, you know, I don't know him by name or anything, but you hear the rumors like, yeah, I seen that buck one point, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then a guy that was hunting the neighbor farm actually found the sheds of that deer from the year before. Oh, wow. So people knew, people knew it was there. Um, but everybody was kind of hush hush about it. And then <laughs> at one point, my uncle ended up selling a portion of his farm to a guy and he was actually stalking it bow season and he wanted to shoot it with the bow because he actually had an opportunity opportunity to shoot that deer. We have like an early season because they were trying to get the doe count down in October, but he didn't take his rifle because he wanted to shoot it with the bow, but he had it relatively close at that time. And he never said anything until after I shot the deer. Then he kind of told us that he's been watching it. That's a man set in his ways if he had it in rifle range but still chose with a bow <laughs> correct yeah yeah he wanted to get it with a bow did you end up getting the sheds back for it the ones that you said your neighbor found well, i'll let jay t uh <laughs> tell that story uh <laughs> if you don't mind <laughs> well when i was down in madison with johnny i think it was the the second or third year we had done a few things together and I see this guy coming walking down the aisle at the Madison Deer and Turkey Expo, and Johnny goes, look at that. And I said, and I, I seen the brow type on the sheds. I said, king buck sheds. And he's like, how do you know? I said, I can tell by the brow tines. And this guy walked up, and I'm like, Johnny. And John, I go, why haven't, do you know about this? He goes, oh, I knew about it. The guy had them at my house. And I said, he wants to sell them. Why didn't you buy him? He goes, why do I want the sheds? I shot the deer. <laughs> <laughs> I was so naive. He actually came to my house and wanted yeah. to compare the original rack with this one. Cause the brow tines were so, I mean, it's amazing how they matched up, you know, from the year before. And I just had no idea. I'm like, well, that's really great. Thanks for bringing them over. Not realizing, you know, people are really big in the sheds and that's how Jay got involved. So I'll let Jay take over from there. Yeah. So the guy came up and he said he was looking to sell them. And I, I said, um, I said, by the looks of them, I said, your best offer is probably maybe 3,500 to 4,000. He goes, you're right on the numbers. And, and I was just because I've been doing it for so long. And I said, I'll give you 10 grand for them. And he said, what? And I said, they're worth that to me because of the King buck and to have the sheds with it. And then that same guy, a couple of years after that, he had also a single from the year before that, that I purchased from him. Oh, wow. So did he find those on his property? I assume. I believe so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because my uncle's farm butts up to their farm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which isn't very far away. Wow. So he's, he's actually had history with that buck and then <laughs> I'm happy for you, but I feel sorry for him and not only him <laughs> kind of, kind, kind of your brother, because I bet you your brother was kicking himself after, after that drive. No, I don't think so. I think we were just all oh, kind of yeah. happy. You know, no, it wasn't like, oh man, I let you sit and you get shoot this deer. Yeah. No, man, I know. I, if I was getting 10, yeah. 10 grand for those sheds, I'd be like, I actually have eight years worth of sheds off of this buck and <laughs> yeah, I'd be getting yeah, replicas yeah. made. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Make it 20 inches smaller. Just keep, keep walking it down. Yeah. That's I, funny. I actually had the bottom jaw to Johnny's deer too. And, uh, because Johnny was, got had it aged and and i seen it out in his garage i said what's that he goes it's the jawbone bottom jaw to the out of the king buck i said can i have it and i and i kept it for years and just for a joke i put online i said selling teeth out of the king buck i said 50 <laughs> bucks tooth, surprising enough this 500 teeth you know just joking and uh 
I kept that for a long time and I ran into this young kid that's just getting in that collecting antlers and stuff. And, and he, he said, if you ever get rid of that job on, I'd like to have it. And I said, what's your address? And I just mailed it to him. He goes, well, what I owe you? I said, people helped me along the way. When I first got started, I said, just consider it a gift for me to you that you have the job on out of the, the original King buck. And so he was pretty happy and I was happy to give him to him, you know? That's, That's awesome. awesome. Very generous what? too. What did uh, what did that thing age? Five and a half. Five and a half. Wow, that's that's kind of crazy because I'm pretty sure Milo's buck was it three and a half or four and a half? Four and a half. That was fo- okay. Okay. Huh. I could have swore it was three and a half at one point, or maybe I just read down on a horrible forum. I don't know. <laughs> so to, I'd like to get into the you know, more more of the story so you shoot you shoot at the buck i think you said twice so far what what happens from there how does the rest of it play out well then i couldn't see him at all because he was in some brush and i was kind of like down from him and i was it was kind of like a set aside field so it's some taller grass it's probably you know three four feet tall so i basically took off crawling and then every 20 30 yards it kind of peeked my head up to see if i could see him and then if i could i would take a shot at him because he wasn't like getting out of those woods. I must've hit him pretty decent. And this went on, it seemed like forever, but it was probably only, you know, three, a couple minutes. But so I finally got to this fence line and I'm like, well, now, now's the time I gotta, I gotta, I gotta get him this point. So I stand up and there he is, but he's kind of like on the top of the knoll and I shot and I couldn't see him. So I'm like, Oh my God, did I get him? So at this point, you know, the drivers are just starting. They're like, what the hell's going on? But so I ran up to where I last saw him and I couldn't see him anymore. So then at that point, I just kind of stood up on this, this knoll so I could watch both sides. So when the drivers came to kick him back out, I knew he wasn't going to get, get away because he, w- he ran back towards the drivers at this point. And then it was just kind of a waiting game. Like I said, I probably waited there. It felt like forever, but who knows, maybe half hour or whatever. And sure enough, they came through and, and drove the buck back to me. And at that point, I shot again and he fell down. So I, I got back up or ran to where I saw him and he got back up again, but he was injured pretty good. And he ran down to the hill. And at that point I shot one more time and he fell down. But at this point I was out of bullets. Uh, unfortunately I got a hand me down uh, hunting suit and it had holes in it and my bullets fell out. So mm-hmm. My cousin Brad was on the bottom side of the drive, so I'm yelling at Brad. Well, the deer couldn't jump the fence, so it was basically just running or, cro- or alongside the fence line. So my cousin Brad ended up coming down to shoot it. And then at that point, we w- walked up to it, you know, a couple high fives and like, oh, my God, you know, I'm out of breath. And this is pretty amazing. And at that point, I set my gun down and just kind of admiring the deer. Well, my cousin, Brad, you know, he, he straddles it at that point and kind of like sits on its back and he's holding up the rack and he's kind of like just admiring it and everything. And then I kind of go around to the front of the deer just so I could kind of see him holding it up. And at that point we thought the deer was done. It went to get back up and it it (laughs) kind of like bunked my cousin off. And, and when that happened, he, was holding on to it so tight that, you know, trying to get off the deer, he was actually one side of the rack actually came off in his hand. I'm like, Jesus, what the hell happened? Well, we figured it out later that one of my last shots going down the hill, you know, just being excited or whatever, I, I must have shot through the main beam and it was just a perfect break. I mean, you could just see the lines where it, it, it went through and just a small bullet hole that you could actually just take the rack and just, just slide it back on. And it would stay there. Mm. So how many shots did you end up shooting at the buck? Like in total, and how many times did you hit it, do you think? Well, when you- we gutted it out, there was seven bullet holes in it. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> what a tank. <laughs> yeah. So at that point, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I can't remember. I would say at least 10 or 11 times. Yeah, at that point. Yeah. They made out of steel up in Wisconsin? Like what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was tough. He didn't want to go down. That's for sure. Yeah. I'm kind of questioning then, bullets fell out of your pockets or if you just let them all fly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I was, I was well prepared. They fell out of my pocket, but yeah. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. 
Did you guys have any idea at that time what you had? Like when the buck, you know, when it's it's down and you finally it, the beam comes off <laughs> and you sh- you shoot it and finish it off. Like, did you have any idea what you had with in front of you? No idea, none at all. We just knew it was a great deer, but like I said, none of us ever scored. Didn't even think it was like world record caliber. Just had no clue. I mean, it's just how it was. So to be honest with you, I wasn't even going to get it scored. So what'd you do with it? Did you just skin it out and then just throw the, I mean, were, were you going to get it mounted? You say? I was going to get it mounted. I, I wasn't sure if I was ever going to get it scored because I broke it. I just didn't, you know, not being up on the rules or anything. I just figured, well, since it's broke that, you know, there's no way I can get it scored. Mm. So yeah, I was just, I took it to a taxidermist and, uh, I was just going to get it mounted. And then as time went on, my brother kind of talked me into it. He goes, you actually got to have somebody take a look at that. So that's, that's when it all started. What did your taxidermist say? Was he, this his jaw on the floor when you walked in with the buck? Well, yeah, kind of. I mean, he wasn't there at the time. So I dropped it off with his wife and they had some freezers down there. So I put it in there and, but yeah, he was pretty impressed, but he didn't say anything like, Oh my God, you know what you have here? Anything like that. But yeah, he was, he called me and he goes, this is probably one of the biggest deer I've ever seen in my life. I, I was just going to say, did he ask you if it was from like a high fence or something like that? Or why wouldn't nope. he surprised? Well, so, I, mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, he was, I mean, yeah, I mean, we didn't really have a huge conversation about it. It was just over the phone, but he goes, yeah, this is oh. one of the nicest deer I've ever seen. But yeah, it, he didn't ask me if it was high fence or anything like that. No. Did you bring it? You said that you could slide the beam back in and that would just kind of sit there. Did you bring it in that state or did you tape it up or did you tell him that it was broke? Oh yeah, I did tell him it was broke. Yep. And then I, um, when I took it there, you know, I just set it in the freezer, but he knew about it. Where does this go from there? You leave it at the tax room. your brother talks you in, you know, you ought to have somebody take a look at it. How does it, how does it unfold from there? Cause I'm sure this is the type of buck that throws the, you know, the whitetail world in a frenzy, but how does it actually get to the point where you're telling people apart from your brother and taxidermist and friends? Well, at that point I just decided, you know, I looked it up online and I just found a, a local score that was in the Baraboo area, which is probably, you know, 45, 50 minutes from where I lived at the time. And I just called them up and I said, Hey, I got a deer I want you to look at. And we set up an appointment and I drove up there and his name was John Ramsey. And then he, he scored it. And did, what did he finally tell you what you had or were you still, were you still, uh, oblivious to it? When it first started, he just kind of looked at it. He, he knew what it was and he, you know, he started kind of explaining things to me and how the scoring system works. And then he kind of put some tape to it and he kind of, he kind of looks at me and he goes, do you realize what you have here? And I'm like, no, I don't. Um, and he goes, well, you possibly have a new world record. And at that point, you know, then it kind of hit me, you know, I'm like, holy crap, you know, never, never would have thought that. Jay, when do you first learn about the buck? Um, I was at home. I do taxidermy work sometimes. And a friend of mine called me and said, you got to go on this website called Lake link. He said, there's a buck on there. People are talking about it could be a world record. And so I went on there and, there was a picture of the deer and the cape and a box and a, just a cardboard box sitting on the floor. I said, yeah, it looks pretty big. And, and then a whole lot of it. Um, and then, uh, his, the guy told me his brother was starting to do some, some, uh, replicas. So we looked up Johnny and made a couple of phone calls to him. And, and we happened to be at the Madison deer and Turkey expo again and displaying his replicas. And I had a couple of my, you know, real antler deer there. And we'd just go down and have fun. And that's when Johnny walked up and shook, he introduced himself said, Hey, how are you doing? My name is Johnny King. I heard you guys want to talk. And I went to my buddy who does the replicas. I said, Johnny King's here. He wants to talk. And he goes, yeah. I said, Johnny King, the King buck, the one that people are talking about. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so we got to talking to Johnny and, uh, I asked Johnny, I said, is the deer here? He goes, yeah, it's upstairs where you get them scored in the scoring booth. And then they put them on a display wall. You, you want to go up and look at it? It's there. And, and I went up there and I, I was 15 feet from it. And I went, oh my goodness, why they got this deer like two feet off the ground? It should be front and center because they had an area for the biggest deer. 
all of a sudden this one's just sitting next to the ground and I kind of crouched down and I go, whatever happened with the deer and the scoring and Johnny got into it and I said, no, that's a hundred percent wrong. I said, I said, I can tell, you know, at this point I was probably five feet from it. I said, that point's a hundred percent typical. I said, he goes, are you sure? I said, there's no doubt in my mind. I said, you can see it from here. I said, uh, I'll examine it once you get it out of here. But I said, and I asked Johnny at that point, I said, did you sign the score sheet and send it in? He said, yeah. I said, pull it, pull it right now. I said, as soon as you can, you call out there and tell them to pull that score sheet. I said, this deer isn't being treated right. And uh, this is the first time me and Johnny had ever met. I had no ideas of buying it or anything. I was just trying to help a hunter out, which I thought I was doing. And so then Johnny, that's what he did. But I found out the reason they did that when Johnny brought it up to the scorer's room up there, one of the guys that were a big part of the deception on the deer was telling all the scores, don't you touch it. Don't look at it. That deer's already been decided. And they went and put it like right next to the ground. So people were walking back and forth and you're looking down on it. You know what that does? The deer shrinks them. And I know Klaus Lebrecht, the number one replicator in the world, sent the guy there just to look at the king buck to get it because he was wanting to contact Johnny and do the replica work on it. And the guy he sent there said, yeah, I seen it. It isn't what you think it is. And well, because they had it sitting on the ground practically, you know, and that's when this whole hoopla kind of got started. Yeah, they did a really bad job and it was kind of face forward. And then they had an actual, what is that, a pipe clamp or whatever, holding the rack together. So it, it wasn't presented very well at all. At this point, you still haven't got that antler fixed and it's just a clamp that's no. holding it together? Correct. Yeah. Well, if you wanted to back up, I guess I could explain to you how they made the ruling. Yeah, that may, let's, let's hear it. All right. So at that point, after I met John Ramsey and he looked at it, says potentially what you got, you know, they got to make a decision on the break, that kind of thing. I called out to Boone and Crockett, sent him out some pictures and they basically kind of told me, well, we really don't have time. If you were going to be doing a show out in Pennsylvania, if you want, you can bring it out there. We'll have our scores. They'll take a look at it. So my, my dad and my buddy of mine, we decided to take a road trip. We went out to Hamburg, Pennsylvania to, uh, I think, the, I think if I remember right, it was like an archery or something scoring Bunica or a Pope and Young show. And, but they would have all the big scores. So they wanted to look at it there. And I just have to say, like, before they made the ruling on it, you wouldn't believe how many friends I had. But <laughs> certainly after that ruling, I didn't have so many friends anymore. But anyway, um, I we went there, dropped off the deer. We couldn't be in the room at the time. So we just kind of walked around Cabela's, you know, probably took like an hour, hour and a half. And then we got the call to kind of come up in the, the room. And at that point, you know, Jack Renau was there and it was just me and him and my buddy and my dad. And he he just basically said, and me not knowing anything about scoring, just kind of took his word for it, you know, basically saying that this is the abnormal point, you know, so it's not the new world record. It's basically a 180 inch class deer. But hey, by the way, you know, there's a lot of people in the back room that have never seen a deer this big. Do you mind if they all come in? So I'm like, well, you know, at that point, I'm like, well, yeah, I don't care. You know, more people to see it. So at that, and then everybody from the back room basically came out and just admired it. So at the time I didn't really put two and two together, but I'm like, you know, haven't people seen a 180 inch class deer, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it was, but for everybody in the back room that, that came out, they were pretty happy to see it. And then that, and then at that point I decided to take it back to Wisconsin, entered in Boone and Crockett at the 180 and that's where Jay kind of picked it up meeting Jay at the show. I get you. So the yep. reason you didn't have the antler fixed yet was just, was just because so everybody could look thing. at it. Yeah. Right. So everybody they could can make a judgment it, yeah. call before they, I guess, epoxied it or however they fix antlers. And so Correct. therefore it wouldn't be voided into the scoring. Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. And what, what exactly, I think there, there's two things, but what, what exactly made the, uh, the issue with the scoring? Is it the common base between the G3 and G4? Is that what made it a 180 class and not a 200 plus? This is Jay's department. Well, the, 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 short, <laughs> on the shorter time, the G3 point on the deer's right antler, 
they said it was a branch point. Common base points, that's the big misconception. Common base points are typical points. As long as they have a match to the other side, it has the figure eight or peanut. Eight. They call it a branch E2. Well, you can clearly see it. I can prove this deer's a world record in 30 seconds by all written rule. And so that's when all the controversy started because we we proved Brun and Crockett wrong that it was a branch point. And so then they came out with another rule, said it was a point off of the inside edge of the main beam. Well, the inside edge rule is for if you got what they call a double row of points or stack points, where there's two points, one on the outside of the main beam, one grows to the inside. The inside one is non-typical, and they, they rule the outside one is typical. So the king buck doesn't do that. And so then they drafted a new rule that has never been used before. It was never in any Boone and Crockett literature. It was never in any scores manual. It showed up, I believe, in the 13th edition of the record book, not in the rule book, in the record book. On page 742, it says it's only a typical tine if it if every tine fills to the outside edge of the main beam. Well, I said, I called Jack Renault and had a couple conversations with him. And I said, you know, I asked Jack, I said, I got a question about a deer from Wisconsin, the King Buck. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. He says, what, do you, what's, uh, what is it? And I said, why did you rule that G3 point non-typical? He goes, because it is. I said, no, what in your rule book calls that point non-typical? This was, I'm backing up. And he said, well, Jay, it's the number one rule in Boone and Crockett. It's because I said so. Mm. And I said, well, Jack, I said, we're going to get nowhere talking like this. I said, I'm a card player from way back. I said, I'll throw all my cards on the table. I said, I'm sitting here with a six by six set of antlers. Every tine has a mate across from it. Every tine comes off the top center of the main beam. I said, what am I missing? He said, because I said so. And I said, well, there's no sense talking about it anymore. And I hung up and more people got to, to know about the deer. Cause I kind of got a big mouth and I wouldn't let it die. And <laughs> all of a sudden Jack Paul calls me back and Hey Jay, I heard you got a question on a deer from Wisconsin. I said, yeah, the, the King, I said, the big King buck. He goes, well, you refresh my memory. He says, I don't know every deer that's out there. I said, well, we just talked about it a week or two ago. I said, you knew it by name. Now you don't know it. And he goes, well, you know, what's the, what's the deal with it? And I said, we already had this discussion, Jack. And, and it didn't go well again. And, and I said, you know, there's no sense talking, but I said, you're going to hear a lot more about this deer. Cause I said, you made a big mistake here. I said, as of now, it's a mistake, but I said, now it's starting to roll into a kind of a cover up. you know, I'm, I'm thinking. And, and, um, and that's when I hit the road and showed people and I was accused of score shop and I never let anybody score it. And, and 99% of the scorers that saw it all agree that that deer is a six by six typical in a world record. And, you know, it went further on and, um, we sent videos out there proving our point. We had scores calling out there all across the country that held it and um it just we we're just spinning our wheels for years and finally we got a i got a letter a call from a score boone and crockett score craig cousins from wisconsin saying they want a panel score of the king buck in september i believe this was 2010 i said really he goes yeah and so i got a letter saying how they're going to score it and in the letter, it said they're going to follow all Boone and Crockett scoring rules and regulations of the Boone and Crockett literature, which I agreed with. But then I seen Boone and Crockett put some on their webpage in another little release that said how they're going to panel score the king by using all Boone and Crockett rules of the time of the harvest and other directives they put in there. And I went, there's their out. They put other directives. That isn't in any of the letters I've seen. Why do they have to use other directives? So I had an attorney drop a, a, a contract saying Jay Fish and Johnny King agreed to the Boone and Crockett scoring the deer. We agreed to, you know, use all the Boone and Crockett scoring methods that are, that are in print at the time of the kill. And we brought it out there and I handed it to Eldon Buck Buckner, who's the head of the rules committee. And Buckner knew what that deer was as soon as he saw it. I mean, just to, he looked at me, he goes, Oh my God, what a specimen. And the chief of staff was standing behind him and he turned around and he goes, Jack never told me shit like this was going on. 
and he had a skull on his face. And so we handed him the deer. Well, first we handed him that letter and he disappeared with it. And the, the chief of staff showed us around a little Boone and Crockett building and stuff. And Buckner came out and handed it. He goes, I am not going to sign this letter and you can take your damn deer and go home. And I said, you mean, I said, we drove all the way out here, followed every rule that you wanted us to follow. We made sure it was here by noon, put in your hands. We just came out here to get this put to bed. I said, you can be in any Boone and Crockett literature. At that point, is non-typical. I said, I'll walk away a happy guy knowing I got the world's biggest 180-inch deer that Johnny shot. But I said, we just want a fair deal. And the deal was nobody was allowed in the building. Johnny King, myself, Buckner, the chief of staff, and the four scores. Nobody else was allowed in there. We got there, and there was people everywhere. And when I when we walked in and dropped off the deer, we went for a ride for about two hours. And we were told nothing will be released, no pictures will be released, the story won't be released until we're all in agreement what that deer is. And I said, that sounds fine. And we rode around Missoula looking for deer and went up in the hills and ended up at a rummage sale, of all things, you know, because we're all nervous and just trying to burn yeah. some well, we get the call and we go back there and me and Johnny are sitting across the table from Buck and I see the score sheet upside down on a on the table in front of him with an ink pen. And he starts explaining to me the scoring process. And he said, we scored it as a typical. And I remember Johnny kind of whispered like, yes, you know, I just wait. He goes, yep, it's a typical five by five with two abnormal points. And I said, okay, what what uh, rule did you use to call it abnormal? He said, Boone and Crockett rules. I said, you told me you'd have every rule available to me when we met after his panel scored it, but I couldn't find it. I said, what do you mean you couldn't find it? I said, this, you could have been scoring a potential world record and you don't even have the information. And he goes, well, uh, Justin Springs gone hunting with his dad. He's the guy that finds us that, you know, knows where all this is at. Call back in a week. He'll be back and we'll get you the information. Well, before I left, he just kept speaking gibberish. And I went, I, I hate to see a seven-year-old man embarrass himself. And I said, you know what, Buck, let's just end it right here. I said, you're making a fool out of yourself. You're speaking in circles. And I just explained to him what I thought. And he yelled at me. You wanted a damn panel? We gave you your damn panel. And he's the only one that raised his voice in that room. Johnny afterwards told me, kind of started feeling bad for him he goes i thought you're gonna make him cry he says <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I said i hate being lying to my face so we barely get out of that private room we get out into the lobby area of boone and crockett and all of a sudden there's cameras in my face and two guys so what do you think of this what do you think of that i'm like who in the hell are you guys well i'm an out i, have a, I write for field and stream and the other one was outdoor light writer and what do you got to say i said i've been trying to contact you guys for five years now you show up now I said, what, sh what happened here was a travesty. I said, this was just not right. And we left. By the time we got out of the Boone and Crockett building, our phones were blown up. Sorry, it didn't work out. Oh, that's a shame. I'm like, what's going on? They had it all over the internet before we even left the building. And they promised us nothing would be released until we we're all in agreement. It, it was all just to make us look bad. And then they came out with Jay Fisher, just a dirty antler collector whining again, blah, blah, blah. And and I remember the field, I think it was the field and stream writer. He wrote, yeah, we're sitting there waiting for the results. And we could hear, it's a 180, he yelled, and come out red-faced and angry. I never yelled once. So I called them up. I said, "If you're," I said, you've never, ever talked to me. You've never seen the deer. I said, the least you could do for your readers is get the truth. I said, you're welcome to come over and look at the deer, bring whatever score you want anytime. I got nothing to hide with it. But they, they they did do an interview with me, and and the first question he asked is, why spend all this time and money to fight Boone and Crockett? I, and I said, you know what, I'm tired of defending myself. I said, ask Boone and Crockett why they're spending so much time and effort and money to fight a deer that they know what it is instead of using their efforts and money for conservation efforts that they that is in their bylaws. And he says, well why not buy a new truck instead of buying antlers? I said, I got a new truck and I collect antlers. And he goes, well, is there, some, are you arrogant about it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. There's some arrogance in it. And I said, if you buy a new truck, you don't take the back roads home. You don't drive down the alleys. Maybe you go down main street with the window down and the music turned a little louder. Cause you're, you're happy or 
you're in a good mood. I said, maybe that's a little bit arrogant. So I'll admit that. But I said, this has never been about me. And I had told Jack early on, he said, uh, well, this has gone too far now. There's nothing we can do about it because he knew what he did. And I, and he's like, you know, you're just out to make money. I said, I'll hand that deer back to Johnny King today. And you'll never hear Jay Fish's name mentioned with it again. I said, I don't need this in my life. I'm raising a family and this and that. But I said, it just, for some reason, this just rubbed me so wrong that a guy that goes out and shoots a great deer and some of the scores are calling him, telling him, hide it away, Johnny. Don't let anybody see it. We'll unveil it together because they wanted to ride piggyback on Johnny's deer. Once the rule went against them, they turned on Johnny like rabid dogs. And the one guy, he denied it. And I talked to the editor, uh, Dan Schmidt of Deer and Deer Hunting. His wife said that the guy in question called her every day. Dan was up in Canada on the hunt. Finally, his wife called him and said, you got to get a hold of this guy. He's bugging about this world record deer. And finally, he called him. Well, when the rule went against him, he turned on Johnny so fast that then, you know, but he was all for it until he got put in his place. Yeah, that was kind of funny. I ran into him at a deer show a couple of years later and I went up and said, hey, and he just looked at me and kind of walked away. I'm like, you know, I was just saying hi, you know what I mean? But yeah, just didn't want anything to do with me, but it's crazy. So they definitely had that. Pan they already knew the outcome of the panel before you guys even showed up. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. See, that's wild. And who's this, who's this Jack guy? And I, I guess who died and made him King. Like if, if his rule is the number one in Boone and Crockett list, like what's his, what's his place in all of this? He was the chairman of the records committee. Buck Buckner was the chairman of the rules committee. And the funny thing is when, when I, I walked up to Buckner and, and handed him that deer and I said, what rule book are you going to use to score it? He said, the rule book at times. So I took out the 2000 scores manual. I said, this is the book you're going to use. And he goes, oh yeah, that's right. He goes, um, we were going to put the new rule in this book, but it was already at print and we didn't have time to get it in there. So that's why it's not in that book. I said, so then why wasn't it printed in fair chase? And why wasn't there a letter mailed to your scores? So there's this new rule that your scores don't even know about. How can they go out and score deer if you were holding back rules? And, and he goes, well, that's all I got to say. I said, well, that's fair enough. And I took out the scores manual from 2009. I said, this is the 2009 scores. He goes, what book is that? I said, it's your 2009 scores manual. And he goes, I didn't even know we had one. I said, you don't even know you have a new book and you're the chairman of the rules committee. You're the guy that puts it together. I said, that rule still isn't in here. I said, nine years later, you still didn't have time to put it in there. I said, see, Buck, this is the issue we got. Nobody can be forthright about what's going on here. And um, after the, I call it the fake panel, which it was, it was just a setup. I called Buckner and we had a couple of nice conversations on the side. And I said, what went on at Boone and Crockett? He says, Jack's arrogance and our laziness. He said, Jack works in Missoula. He's a full-time employee. And we just got lazy and didn't check up on him. And we figured he was running it right. You know, we, we didn't expect anything like this. And more or less, he said, well, it's too late now. It's too, too many people out in the public. I said, there's a lot of big corporations that make mistakes. And, and you write a, a apology. We're a very forgiving society. I said, Boone and Crockett will be looked up just as they were before. Just a mistake was made and somebody got a little bit overzealous with his position. It's an easy fix. I said, the numbers are there. You've already scored it. You have the numbers. The antlers are still available to you at any time. I said, this isn't, was this a ball or a strike in the 1968 World Series that nobody knows about? I said, everything on the information is still right there in front of you to fix this. They chose a different route. In your opinion, I'm sure it's hard. It may be hard to say, but you know, you, you hear people talk about a carrot and a stick, like the incentive structure. Like, what is the what is the incentive? What is the reason to not allow another a new buck to world record? But that's rightfully its its claim. I, I don't I don't understand what people what skin people have in the game here, unless there's something dark and shady and from a monetary perspective going on. It's, uh, I've got examples of other deer they've done this to there. One of them's even more egregious than what they did to the King book. Um, Buckner told me that back in the nineties, mid to about the mid nineties, that's when they passed the rule that they will accept broken beams and broken tines if they fit back together and they don't affect the score. And 
Buckner got it passed through and Jack was furious. He didn't want that rule in there. All of a sudden, Johnny's deer shows up and it's broke. Totally something that Renault is a hundred percent against. I just think he was like, there's no stinking way I'm letting this deer in. It was broken. And pretty much what Buckner told me, he said, Jack was totally against my broken beam rule, even though it was voted on by the rules committee. And that's another thing. After I was told to call back to Boone and Crockett to get that information, I called and Justin Spring answered. I said, Hey, Justin, I heard your hunt with your dad. Yeah. I said, hope you had a great hunt. He goes, yeah, I got a, or my dad got a pronghorn. I didn't get nothing. I said, but that you wouldn't have it any other way. Right. Oh yeah. He said, I, I was there to get, make sure my dad got one. I said, well, congratulations. Glad you're still able to go with your father and hunt. I said, that's pretty special. And I told him how Buckner told me, he says, well, yeah, I just got back in. Can you give me a week and call back? So I waited a week, called back. No, I still haven't had time getting ready for the new, you know, panel scoring, getting things set up. So I waited two weeks and I called back and I said, I hate to keep bugging you, Justin, but I'm just going by what, what, uh, Buck Buckner told me, Eldon Buck Buckner told me to call you back. He said, Jay, you will never get a thing from us ever again. And don't ever call here again. And he slammed the phone down. That's the last time I talked to Missoula about the King book. I've been using the new Exodus rival cell camera for the last couple months. And I have found a beautiful mainframe eight point with tons of stickers to go after this fall. Ooh. One thing I do appreciate about Exodus trail cameras is all of the cameras share the same data plans. So you only pay for what you need. A lot of cell cam companies charge you for HD pictures. I've seen prices of $5 for 50 HD pics. Exodus is going to give you unlimited HD pictures right to your phone which is awesome when you're sitting there in the middle of the summer and it's 100 degrees and you just want to binge a bunch of trail cam photos. If you're looking for a solid cell camera with great performance and a five-year no BS warranty, go check them out. So as we all know, hunting gear is something people can make way too complicated. Arrows can be the exact same way. Instead of going down all those rabbit holes, trying to sift through the endless information that's online, and you're not really sure if it's right or wrong, Exodus makes it simple to get the right arrow for your exact setup. So go online to the Exodus Arrow Builder. It takes less than a minute. You're gonna enter your draw weight, your draw length, and how heavy of a point you're shooting. And it's gonna be that simple. Let the guys at Exodus take care of the rest. So if you're interested in Exodus Rival cell cameras or a new set of their MMT arrows, just go to exodusoutdoorgear.com and use code HA15 for 15% off anything on the website. Once again, that is exodusoutdoorgear.com. Use code HA15 at checkout for 15% off. Now let's get back to the podcast. So is Jack furious about the the common base or is it mainly about the broken antler part of it? Because didn't, I'm not 100% on, on Milo score, but doesn't your buck have three three inches on the Milo buck, right? Or something like that. Um, Johnny's deer is over two eighteen. Two eighteen, closer to five inches. Yeah. Okay, five inches. So, even if putting on that 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 antler back on, and let's say you give and take, and I don't know how people way smarter than me can figure this out. Let's say they take an X ray of it and just even if you give a an inch or two of leeway just from putting the antler back on, it's like that's still over the Hanson buck. So. It, so is he more upset about the the broken antler part of it, or the dub, or the common common base, or is it just like a a mesh between the two? It's um, it's the broken antler part of it because when it was scored, it was scored around where the hole was, and it was scored above, and there was a smaller circumference. The H, the H two or H, yeah H two circumference was still smaller up above where it was shot so that score never came in that the hole never came into play and that fit in there so tight that it wouldn't affect the score and jack's words were how can we have a deer with a broken tine and that ugly little point i said that point is only well my words were that point serves a couple purposes jack he said what's that i said when i do shows people go wow that score is that high and it's got that that shorter point what would it be if that was all lined up? It would be in the mid two twenties, typical. And I said, the other serve <laughs> point serves another purpose is it leaves the door open for the next great buck to beat this one. You know, yeah, and and uh, you know, and and he just uh, 
he 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 was coming close a couple of times to doing what was right, and then he'd just back away. <clears throat> and um, it, it, it's a shame that this would have been the first time in whitetail history that there could have been a so-called passing of the torch, one world record holder to another, because the top non-typicals were found dead, the hole in the horn in the Missouri Monarch. Mm-hmm. Jordan was dead way before milo shot his and i told jack i said you're stealing such an opportunity from the hunting public to get johnny king and milo doing a so-called passing of the torch promoting hunting promoting your fair chase the hunting world would have come together so strongly for this event and again i would have had nothing to do with it i i was more than happy to hand that deer back to johnny at any time and um you know i only took over because i didn't want to see a good guy get screwed over excuse my way of putting it but it was just wasn't right yeah what do they expect from from a deer because i mean just milo's deer in itself is is an anomaly and so it takes another anomaly just i mean just as much if not greater to obviously beat that score but a deer of this caliber i mean what (laughs) what percentage does like is it going to take for for that buck to get beat out if this one is discredited just world because records, of that e- extra main beam special you know world records are special it takes that's why they they last for so long um it's it's uh probably something we may not see in my lifetime you know again who knows or it could happen next year you just don't know that's the joy of hunting that's mm-hmm. more more special than a world series or a super bowl because that's a team effort and it's there's a new one crowned every year who knows how long it's going to take to crown another deer that will knock johnny's deer back well it seems like uh, we've talked with folks around the mitch rompala buck and and now the king buck it it seems like they try to either find some sort of minute discrepancy or may heck even make up a new rule or just rule however they want or they pr nightmare someone into the grave where they just eventually are so sick of it they just give up on trying to put the record in the book and i just i just wonder why like that doesn't make any sense to me isn't the point of the record books to be broken aren't aren't they to show the next best specimen and then the next best specimen right and it just seems like milo's buck's been beaten a couple times and they it just it's it's never been replaced though in terms of a world record. Yeah. Well, do they need to switch the category to symmetrical or perfect? Because like that's I mean, kind of like what you were saying, it does have that, you know, that that shorter G3, but it's also matched on the other side. And so I mean, at first glance, you're definitely looking at a typical what it seems like, but I mean, what's it gonna take, I guess? Well, Buckmaster scored it. They use the Boone and Crockett scoring system. They just don't use inside prep. The King Buck is their world record perfect category deer because it doesn't have, um, what is it, six inches of deduction side to side. It's unheard of. And three and a half are from the one point. I mean, that's how symmetrical this deer is. We had this deer brought into a machine shop setting. And that point the, the where the base of that G3 is like within an eighth of an inch of the base of the G3 on the other side, that's how close they are on the beams together. And this point actually does sit a little further to the outside. It's just what you call a stunted point. So it didn't fill all the way out to the outside edge. That was never a rule. If it had what they call the figure eight or peanuting, the valley between, it used to be, you just had to add that valley on the inside. Then they switched it. It's got to be on the outside. I had Larry Wyshoon inspect this and he's like, this is a world record. He says, you can see the, peanutting you can see the figure eight he goes i just don't get what they're, why they're doing this i had i did a show with larry down in alabama years ago and it's just confusing everybody because it's one guy i think made a mistake and his arrogance wouldn't let him fix it yeah i think it's pride he didn't want to admit that he was wrong and you get so far in you just there's no way to get back out well and it's from the from the deer hunting community's perspective like I'd say it this way, but nobody knows the head of Boone and Crockett's name. Like they don't, I, the average person doesn't care about that at all, but the average person does know the biggest buck in the world. And mm-hmm. so it's like, if you made a mistake, 
just, I mean, I hate, you hate to make a mistake at the Super Bowl, right? On the biggest one that, that's ever been. But man, what's right is right, whether you made a mistake or not. That's crazy. We're human, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, too much politics. Yeah. 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 It's still an easy fix to this day. I mean, we brought it down to Bass Pro Shops and, and we were in a meeting with Jerry Martins and, and Jerry Martin said, would you, what did you come down here for? Do you want to sell it? I said, no. I said, you are getting more involved as a company with Boone and Crockett's Crockett. their panel scoring stuff in that. And I said, I just want you to see what, what's going on. And, and I put the King Buck in front of him and he goes, well, can I put it to it? I said, can't score it. He goes, well, I'm a scorer for show me big bucks. And he goes, he ran a credit card up and down the side and you can see the figure eight in the daylight. He goes, this is a world record. And I said, yeah, he goes, there ain't no doubt in my mind. This is a world record whitetail. I said, it is. And we got to talk and he goes, can I pick that up again? I said, yeah. He goes, man, the weight of this deer is just incredible. He goes, this thing's, he goes, we want to buy it. What do you want for it? I said, it's not for sale. And I said, any of that, that would have to be done in private because I would talk to Johnny about it before I do anything with it. I always talk to Johnny because it's his family name on the deal, not mine. And I'm not going to go around and cause trouble with the King Buck when it's Johnny's name on it, you know? And so he invited us to go to their um, new gun museum that was being built. And he goes, Jay, you're riding with me. And I jumped in. He goes, so let's start talking numbers. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, we want it. and We want it now. I said, let's say, I, let's say Johnny and I agree to sell it to you i said would johnny just become a footnote in history and and you would have the deer or what would you do with it he said well you know we're building the whitetail museum it'll be front and center he goes we'd have johnny king do some guest appearances at some stores we'd have them on our tv show they do a little hunting show i guess and he said um you know and we would do a johnny king commemorative rifle i said can't you do it because it's the right thing to do you have to own it to do what's right. He goes, Jay, if we owned it, it'll be a world record within a week. Boone and Crockett won't fight us. And I said, I, I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with my own skin. I said, Jerry, I understand that if Jay fish calls Boone and Crockett with a complaint, I'm nothing but a whiner. I said, I understand your company calls there. It's two different conversations. I'm comfortable enough to, to know that, you know, and, and he really wanted deer bad. And I, I just told him, no, it's not for sale. He goes, what do you think that deer's worth? I said, well, you hear that all the time. It's a million dollar deer. There has never been one. But I said, this one truly is a million dollar deer. He says, why? Because you own it. I said, no, because it's the new world record, not just beating Milo's deer, but the world record coming back to Wisconsin after the Jordan held it for how many years? All of a sudden you get the world record back to Wisconsin. You just have the King of Bucks tours. Now you have the King Buck in your King of Bucks tour. Just the name alone. I said, you will make a million dollars in the first year off memorabilia on that deer. He says, you're exactly right. I said, I'm not saying I'm selling it, but I said, that's where I set the value. I said, now to a private collector, no, it ain't worth a million dollars, but to your company, you would make that back in a drop of a hat. And, um, and we left there and, you know, and I asked him, I said, could you work? No, I, we don't want to upset Boone and Crockett. And I, and I asked him, I said, who keeps your doors or your stores open? He said, what's that? What do you mean? I said, is it the average hunter coming in buying your product or is it Boone and Crockett coming in here? He said, well, it's the average hunter. They, I said, you know how good you would look to the average hunter to stand up for what's right? Uh, just a guy hunt with family, shoots a deer off in our old dairy farm land. I said, the story isn't, can't get any better. It's, it's one of the purest hunting stories you'll ever hear. No trail camera pictures, no food plot, no big bait pile. Just a guy with his family was fortunate enough through God's will to shoot just the most incredible typical whitetail ever. Yeah, and they they said to you, to your face, that they could have that as the world record in a week. Absolutely. Yep. That, that'll make you sick. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so the only thing holding uh holding back that buck from being a world record is is the willingness to to exchange hands well that's where it was then i i'm sure it's not there anymore yeah. because of the negative press we've gotten because of it and i and i knew the negative press was coming i mean 
look at the organization Boone and Crockett named two of the greatest explorers our country's ever seen founded by a president and who's Jay Fish to question them. You know, I knew that the swords were going to come at me and, and I was willing to accept that. I, I'm a big boy. I knew what I was doing. You know, I always say, I apologize to a lot of people. I was mouthy early on. I was younger and never been put in a position like this, you know, and didn't know how to carry myself. And, and nobody is listening to, to me for a long time. And I don't want to keep using me because it was a group effort, but I don't want to have to name names throughout this. I would say some of the most off the wall things just to get people talking. And then they'd come on my Facebook page and I'd explain what I meant. And then I was getting, went from 10, 20 clicks to 200 clicks. And then I was able to get my point across because I, I, I learned that can't beat the information in the people you have to educate them because I started off not knowing the scoring system. So I was degrading people for not knowing something I didn't know 10 years before this, you know? So I, my whole attitude changed. It had to change because, you know, and it really changed that one day. And I was kind of frustrated after a night of debating and my wife goes to me, when was the last time you read your Bible? I said, it's been a long time. She goes, when was the last time you prayed about this? I said, I haven't. She goes, you're going to be in turmoil for the rest of your life about this. And I sat down and talked and thought about it. And that's when I started to read my Bible again and praying and reading. And, and things started changing. I wasn't arguing with people on the internet anymore. They can call me whatever they want. I don't care. You know, before I, it would bother me right to my soul, right to my heart. And I'm like, I don't even know these people. They don't know me. They're protecting an organization that they believe in. And that's the, the, what I had to get in my head is just be nice, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, yeah, I, I could see how that'd be pretty convicting because, uh, it's hard if you know, justice hasn't been correctly served, but vengeance isn't ours to have as no. believers. Right. And I don't know. Sometimes I sit back and I'm like, yeah, vengeance isn't ours, but I could be God's instrument, you know, use me, <laughs> yeah, use, yeah, there you go. Yeah. use me to yeah. right the wrong. Right. But yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I use that. this deer as a vessel now. It's a vessel for me to like when I, when I travel with the deer, I've done so many shows with that deer. I would never have had the chance to speak to the people I got to speak to just me by myself. Who would ever want to come and see this old stupid ass from upper Michigan. <laughs> 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 But that King Buck opened so many doors to me and it got me to open my Bible and everything. So now I can talk at such a level that I'm not saying that the words are being given to me, you know, you're mm -hmm. actually right. Yeah, we've gotten to meet there. a lot of great people. Yeah. Yeah. I am writing a book. It's all, it's written now. It's at three different people's right now. Um, doing some private readings of it. And it was funny because. I was asked for many years to write a book about the journey and, and I was going to name it the King Buck, the true story. And my wife, again, all of this over a stupid deer. She goes, there's so much more you can do with your life. And I had to sit and think. And about two days after reflecting and just going up in the hills where I always go to think, it came to me. This isn't about a deer. It's about a journey that the deer brought me on that helped me find my salvation and God. And, and it's opened the doors to so many like-minded people. And so my wife and I, we separate in the house in the morning. She'll go by the little wood stove and I'll go to another room and we read our Bibles and we get together and talk about what we read. And I went upstairs and I read for about five minutes and it, and I just hit me and I go downstairs. I said, well, I got the name of the book. I said, it ain't just a stupid deer it led me to God and my salvation. So I said, there's that. I said, the name of the book's going to be finding the King, just how I found the Lord through the King buck. And so that's the title of it. It's being read right now by three people. And so far they have been giving me some pretty good reviews. It's taken a lot longer than I thought, but you know what, if I'm talking, um, scripture and, and, how I found the Lord through this. I'm a very aggressive person by nature. I call it getting out in front of God instead of waiting. So I have to step <laughs> many times and drop my pen and go, that's my arrogance again. God help me through this next 
few pages, you know, and what a, what an awesome, awesome year and a half it was writing that. It was just amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, what, I, I guess the question I have is like, where, do, where did Johnny, from your perspective, where do we go from here? Is it just in the Lord's hands and we just wait to see justice done or what do you think? Well, it, it's, it's hard to believe it's going to be close to 18 years. And now that we're kind of talking about it, I would like to thank a lot of great people that me and Jay have both met over the years. I mean, it's been quite a journey, like Jay said, over a stupid deer, but we're just trying to get the right thing done. And in the meantime, I'd like to really thank like Buckmasters, Northeast Big Buck Club. I mean, these guys actually went out of their way and did what's right for the deer and scored it basically along, you know, the, the B and C rules. And they made it records in their records books. And I'm really thankful for them for that. As far as the future goes, I mean, people haven't stopped talking about it. I mean, you sent me a message what like a month ago saying if we wanted to do this. And it's just hard to believe that people you've never met behind closed doors, how many people are actually still talking about the deer. It's kind of humbling, you know. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it. there, I never get sick of looking at uh big deer i mean exodus outdoor gear always does some really really good videos about these little short highlights of all these monster bucks and every one of them i just find myself just nose to the my phone screen just <laughs> like oh my gosh that is so I, I never get sick of looking at them i mean ever yeah and so well it's all what we strive to do too like like as hunters like the chance of us sitting out in the deer woods and you know, shooting a buck of that caliber is probably slim to none, but I mean, Hey, it happened to you on a family deer drive. And it's just like, that's what, whether you want to believe it or not, whether you want to be a meat hunter or a trophy hunter, that's what we strive to do. And it's just like, when that actually happens, it's just like, it's so, I don't know. It's so like in all of that deer and like, granted, I know it's just in the grand scheme of things, it's just a deer, but still like, I mean, there's, there's something always interesting about it. Yep. Yeah. And, well, perfect. Yeah. Yeah touched on the northeast big buck club um i went out to vermont to have it panel scored for a northeast big buck club no promises or nothing i could have drove out there and they could have said yeah it is what it is and there was i mean it was scored at ron bushy's house he's the the scorer that helped so much along the way what a good man he is and there was a potluck people came from maine new hampshire new york the house was full of people and I invited two of my friends from Maine to come down to watch this history. And they set the deer on a big table and they had all the Boone and Crockett literature laid out. Every Fair Chase magazine, everything. And it sat there for about an hour or maybe a little more. I stayed away from it. I didn't want to interfere with the scores, let them do what they do. And Jeff Brown, the founder of the North East Peak Buck Club, he goes, well, he says, can I have everybody's attention? He goes, um, We've all had time to research and look at the king buck. And then he's like, if you have anybody has anything else to say, let me finish. And then you can give me your feedback. He goes, but after reviewing all the Boone and Crockett literature, everything ever printed by Boone and Crockett, and examining the king buck, I find that in many places within the rules that that is a six by six typical. He said, I find nothing in any literature that calls that point abnormal. He said, I suggest we get the panel together and we score it and put it to paper and that's it. All every guy in the room said 100% correct. That is a typical point. They scored it. They declared it their number one deer for the Northeast Big Buck Club. They, they cover the seven corridor states out in the Northeast, but they have a others category. And actually this deer beat Milo's out of that too. And so Milo's is now, I think, three in their book now. And um, so, yeah, um, they did it right. They were open and honest. And and I know Jeff Brown is also a Boone and Crockett scorer, and they used the Boone and Crockett scoring system. And he called Jack or no and said that we're going to be scoring the King Buck. And Jack said, I wish you wouldn't. And he said, well, nothing to do with your club. This is strictly for the Northeast Big Buck Club. We will be scoring it over the weekend. And Jack said, well, I can't stop you. And when it was done, Jack asked Jeff to call him to let know how it turned out. He said, well, this is how we scored it. This is where it ranks. And Jack said, well, I wish you wouldn't have. I think you did it wrong. 
but not I can do when he hung up. I mean, he wasn't happy. But this was a guy that was a stand-up guy, Jeff Brown. He said, you know, where to this day, the deer was scored by a scorer for Wisconsin Buck and Bear Club who should have a big interest in the deer. It's the state's club. They used to be the third largest scoring organization in the world with Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, and North and uh, Wisconsin Buck and Bear. They won't touch this deer. It was scored by their now president. And he has the score sheet and he won't turn it in because they told him as soon as they turn it in, they're just going to kick it out and it'll be done anyway. So here's a deer that's been celebrated by buck masters, by Northeast big buck club, safari club, international scored it as a six by six typical and its own home state just keeps pushing it aside. And they go as far as to try to get me banned from shows with it. <laughs> yeah, I wish I would have had a little bit more support, especially from my own state, even if it didn't get Boone and Crockett, but to at least recognize it in the state of Wisconsin. I don't I don't understand the uh, emotional nature of all these people, because it's like, how can your ego be so fragile that somebody shoots a big buck and it's like, I don't like that. Mm, I'm mad. It's like, <laughs> if, I don't understand that. I, I really don't. There was a typical the other day that. Uh, it was in Ohio and I think it was like a 206 inch typical and he had it scored and it, it, it netted at like 138 inches. I it was, saw it. Was, and- yeah. <laughs> you, did you see it? Yeah. 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 I, I saw yeah. that buck at ATA show. It looked pretty typical to me and it netted like 138. It was like, it's a yeah. monster. <laughs> it's insane. It's insane. It's oh insane. yeah. And like I tell people when they, they would, they would start with me. They're like, if you don't like what Boone and Crockett does, go somewhere else. And that's what I always tell everybody. If you don't like the Boone and Crockett scoring system, you don't like deductions, go somewhere else. There's plenty of other scoring. My beef isn't their scoring system. It's not following their rules and trying to make up new rules. That's my only beef with them. Other than that, I'm sure Boone and Crockett has done some really good things out there, but they really dropped the ball. I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Dudney buck. Hmm. The okay. only 400-inch mule deer in the world. It was scored. Entry score, 388 inches. The Broder Buck is the world record, 355. This one scored at 388. It goes down a panel score in 1995 to Dallas. I believe the two panels that scored it down there, they got to have three panels, two guys on each panel. What The two panels that scored it there both came back at over 400 inches. It arrived late because it took a while for it to get in from Canada. So it had to go for and get the third panel done. So Ron Bushy and another scorer were asked to go to the banquet a day early to get the final score. So it could be declared. I got the score sheet. It says new world record right across the top of it. Then they scribble it out and put no world record. So these two scorers get there a day early to get the final panel on it. And they go there and the guy goes to Jack or no, I'm here to score the duty buck to get it, he goes, don't worry, it's already taken care of. He goes, well, we came out here a day early to do it. No, it's already taken care of. Don't worry about it. They dropped it to a 339-inch deer by a guy that wasn't even a panel scorer, wasn't even supposed to be a panel judge from Alberta, where the where the Broder buck is from. You think he might have a little interest to keep the Broder number one from his home province? Dropped that deer 80 inches after it was panel scored. I talked to a couple of the panel scorers. They said it's the biggest slap in the face they've ever had from scoring because if you have a discrepancy, that's why they have panels of two and three panels. You get together and you talk it out. Where did you find the differences? They said, we assumed for three months it was the world record. All of a sudden we get the newsletter about the banquet. Dude, me buck 339. He goes, I have no idea how they dropped that deer. They never called us about it. They never asked us. They just arbitrarily dropped it. So, so Jay, do you do you think world records are meant to be broken? Absolutely. Do you think they will be broken? I hope so. Do you think what I'm <laughs> saying is, do you think the the big arm of these organizations will ever allow those to to, to happen for a white tail deer? If the right person shoots it and it has the right look, he's a white tail hunting. We can all do it. We don't have to have no big highfalutin hunts. Joe Blow still has a really good chance. I mean to go out there and do something special. Mm. So, so it's almost like a preference thing because like Milo's it's, it's clean, but the thing about it is, is there's, I mean, compared to like uh, your buck, Johnny, there's not a whole lot of mass comparatively. Right. Or, or at least yep. the looks of it. So it has to be, 
It has to be typical, but just in the right manner, apparently. Well, Milo's actually has two non-typical points on his. This is an eight by six. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Johnny yeah. King's deer is the only deer in whitetail world that grows score over 225 inches with zero non-typical points. There isn't even one that grosses over 220 with zero non-typical points. That's how special this deer is. That's an anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane to even think about. It really but, is. Man. Well, guys, uh, we appreciate you hopping on with this and uh just I know we've only talked to you a couple times on the phone and, uh, you know, an hour and a half long podcast, but you guys seem, you know, like salt of the earth people. And, uh, again, we appreciate it. Well, Thank thanks you. a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's like I told a guy the other day, I said, if I was lying about this deer, Boone and Crockett would have, would have stepped on me like a cockroach years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're still trying. <laughs> They're still trying. And, and that's what I yeah. was trying to do is call them out. I wanted them to send me a cease and desist letter saying, don't claim it this and that. And I was going to say, sure, prove it, prove that I'm wrong and I'll go away. But I haven't got that letter yet. <laughs> yeah. So for, uh, for folks that listen to this podcast and they want to keep up with what's going on with maybe you two guys and then, the continued story of the King book, where's the best place for them to follow you or see the book that you guys got going on? I guess we'll start with you, Jay, and then we'll go to Johnny. Well, I'm just on Facebook. I answer questions all the time on there. And if anybody has any questions, they can private message me or they can shoot me any question they got. I'm an open book. I've got nothing to hide, never have. And, uh, and if I do any appearances with the deer, I always post it to let people know. What, what is your page called? It's just my Facebook page, Jay Fish. That's it. Jay Fish. Got it. Cool. Johnny, what about you? Same thing. Just Johnny King on Facebook. All right. Well, that sounds good. Thank you guys so much for doing this. And we'll we'll stay in touch. I, I want to see what continues to happen with this, even though even if it's another decade before we get another update. Well, you're still <laughs> young. So watch for this to go on. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> if anything happens in the meantime, I'll I'll make sure I keep you guys up to speed. Okay. All right. Yeah, sounds I appreciate good. Appreciate it.